Okay, everybody, welcome uh, tonight. Uh, and uh, can I, uh, first of all, uh, acknowledge traditional owners of the uh, country that each of us are on. Uh, in Brisbane, where I am, it's the Yagara and the Turrbal people, and uh, we, repay, we pay our respects to uh, their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so, uh, and thank you all for logging in tonight. Our guest presenter is Dr. Llewellyn News, and his subject matter is Japan's net zero carbon emissions announcement, what happens now? And you might recall or that um, in October 2020, uh, Japanese Prime Minister uh, Suga uh, announced a net zero emissions target by 2050. Now, for those of us who have any knowledge about Japan, um, one of the world's most energy intensive countries, uh, fifth largest polluter, I think, uh, it is a massive challenge, but one that they clearly believe that they're up to the task on. Uh, so I might just introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Llewellyn Hughes is the Associate Director Dean for Research at the College of Asia and Pacific uh, Australian National University and an Associate professor, professor at the Crawford School of Public Policy. In his academic work, uh, Llewellyn is interested in how public policies affect and are affected by energy markets. He is currently investigating how and why energy policies are changing in response to the problem of climate change with a particular focus on the Asia Pacific region. Uh, an ongoing project examines how the rise of global value chains affect the ability of governments to promote green growth industries. In addition to his academic research, uh, he assists companies in the energy and environmental sectors navigate regulatory issues in Japan. He received a PhD from the MIT uh, and whole, uh, that's Massachusetts Institute of Technology and holds a master's degree from the University of Tokyo. He is trained as a simultaneous and consecutive interpreter in the Japanese language and is a, and is a citizen of Australia, New Zealand and Great Britain. So uh, a very impressive uh, CV indeed that he has. So uh, I'll, uh, without further ado, welcome Llewellyn and hand over to him uh, for tonight's contribution. Thanks, Paul. And uh, I will just note that I'm thankfully no longer uh, working as a simultaneous interpreter. It's truly one of those jobs where the only time you get noticed is uh, when you've done something wrong. Um, sometimes strategically so in the case of our former Prime Minister Hashimoto famously, um, who uh, blamed his interpreter um, when uh, his statement moved markets. Uh, so greetings to everyone. And um, let me first say thanks to the AIIA for having me along. Um, I thought I'd spend about uh, 30 minutes or so uh, just uh, giving a view on um, Japan's net zero announcement um, and then uh, open things up and look forward to the discussion uh, and debate. Um, obviously, this is an issue of uh, great interest to Australia, given the long standing um, relationship, economic relationship, uh, in particular commercial relationship between Japan and Australia um, in the traditional uh, fossil fuel segment. So um, when Japan says net zero, um, you know, that uh, has the potential to have, uh, have real effects on, uh, on Australia's export profile and the composition of the economy more generally. So I've, um, I've got a couple of slides uh, as is um, uh, common. So let me just uh, share those if you don't mind. Um, uh, if anyone wants to um, uh, ask a question uh, while I'm, I'm speaking uh, for about 30 minutes or so, as I said, um, then uh, please um, just uh, raise your hand. I think that uh, Zoom has one of these electronic hand functions and I'll be happy to, uh, happy to um, stop and, um, and, and chat. Um, as, uh, as, as was noted a moment ago, um, Prime, Prime Minister uh, Yoshide Suga uh, of Japan announced um, at his, uh, actually um, his kind of uh, first speech to the parliament, to the extraordinary session of parliament in October of last year, uh, that the country will aim to be um, uh, carbon neutral um, by 2050, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions to zero by 2050. It's quite an interesting statement because actually there is a small difference between those two things. Um, 
that is that CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas, of course. You have methane, um, you have uh, HFCs and other uh, refrigerants, for example, that can also contribute to uh, climate change. And so there was a little confusion at first um, about whether this was a CO2 neutral uh, statement or whether it was a statement broadly uh, about greenhouse gas emissions inclusive of other emission types. Um, the difference in the case of Japan, CO2 makes up about uh, just a shade over 90% of Japan's total emissions profile. So there's a difference of about 10% or so in that statement. Um, and uh, I think it's pretty clear if you look at uh, you know, subsequent material that uh, we're really talking about a greenhouse gas emissions um, net zero target by 2050 rather than just carbon. Uh, carbon dioxide. So um, it's the more ambitious of those uh, two things. Now, I have to say that this was a surprising announcement. Um, many of you perhaps follow Japan um, and, uh, and how decisions get made there. And if you do, you'll know that uh, in many sectors, and the energy sector is certainly one of these, uh, decision-making tends to be fairly bottom-up, fairly technocratic, and um, fairly incrementalist. So there's a whole swath of uh, standing committees within the ministries and agencies, which kind of run policy on a sectoral and technology basis. And uh, they, um, you know, kind of uh, targets bubble up from below uh, within that kind of committee structure. And it, it's quite effective um, as a way of going about things um, because you you can be confident that you know any targets you set are achievable through that through that process, um, but it does uh, not necessarily lend itself to ambition. And um, what's quite surprising about the announcement by uh, Prime Minister Suga is that um, that if you look at the uh, the, the the shift in some of the key committees which set energy policy in Japan, um, or at least, uh, you know, propose it to Parliament if it requires legal change, for example, there was no um, uh, statement or discussion about net zero prior to the speech of the Prime Minister. And actually, um, I'll, I'll probably mention this a little later or we might get into it in, in Q&A, but um, Japan's currently uh, rewriting its midterm uh, energy plan that happens every three years. And um, uh, when this statement was made, uh, the, the first of those meetings had already occurred. And if you look at the kind of midterm planning, there was no mention of, um, of net zero in that. In the second meeting uh, of the key committee, um, which is discussing uh, the midterm energy targets, uh, net zero appeared. Um, and so there was, uh, it was clear that, um, you know, in some of those important parts of the machinery of government, uh, that, this, um, that this statement was, uh, you know, not, uh, was, was fairly atypical of, um, you know, other approaches um, that, that are typically taken. And actually you can see that change really playing itself out now in some of the committee processes uh, as well. So it's actually really quite fascinating to see the Im implementation of scenario modeling, for example, using some integrated assessment models um, to kind of see what pathways to net zeros are and work backwards from those. Um, and that's, that's typically not the process which Japan has used to think about um, setting targets for the energy sector. So it's been quite a big, quite a big deal, um, this, this change. Uh, you know, many of you, um, you know, may work in the energy sector, um, and so, you know, this material won't be uh, new to you, um, but just to set a little bit of context here, um, you know, Japan, like many countries, has been uh, facilitating considerably more investment, particularly in renewable energy in the power sector. And on a global basis, as you can see here, there's been an enormous ramping up uh, in terms of installed capacity, which we often hear about, but also in terms of generated electricity, which this shows you, uh, for um, wind, that's onshore and offshore wind, and solar photovoltaics, 
over about the last 20 years. And you can see those curves here. It's often what you read about in the paper, for example. I'll show you, um, you know, th this is on a global basis uh, with data drawn from BP Statistical Review of World Energy. Um, but to give an idea of the kind of challenge of net zero, uh, you know, even in the power sector, which we might think about as one of the easier uh, sectors to, uh, to deal with, um, uh, although that looks impressive, uh, you can see that if you uh, put a global nuclear power generation, for example, against it, then power generated by wind and power generated by solar, although growing more quickly, is still quite small relative to um, the uh, nuclear generation source. And all of those are dwarfed by uh, the amount of power which is generated by thermal coal globally, um, which has seen a, a downtrend recently, but um, you know, it's obviously been growing very rapidly. A lot of that's um, been driven by China, of course. So the idea of net a mid-century net zero, it's not that far away anymore, 30 years, um, is, uh, you know, is, is extraordinarily uh, challenging as, as a target to achieve. Um, this is what uh, Japan uh, looks like. So you can see uh, here the equivalent uh, from 1985 through to 2019. This is generated electricity in terawatt hours. And um, I've labeled here the different uh, sources uh, of, of, of electricity. Remember here, this is focused on the power sector. There are other issues in transport um, and uh, also in industry, steel making and the like. So I've kind of brought the lens down to focus on power, which is one of the easier components of, uh, of decarbonization more generally. But this really presents to you what the challenge is that, um, that the Suga administration faces over, and um, Japan faces uh, over the next 30 years to, to move these lines uh, rapidly um, for uh, coal in particular uh, downwards and to ramp up solar and wind and, um, and nuclear as well. You know, it's a, it's a very, very challenging target which, uh, which the, the government um, has, has set for itself. And I mean, the other thing I suppose to mention here is that uh, it obviously comes on the back of uh, similar announcements which, which have been made uh, in Europe, which have been made by South Korea, for example, um, soon after Japan. Uh, China has also and at least announced the ambition of net zero by 2060. So there have been a lot of um, uh, these kinds of statements and Japan is, is coming on board as well. Um, you know, how much did ge does geopolitics, for example, play in the announcement um, of the Suga administration? It's a pretty tough thing to measure, if you like, um, you know, unless you have access to the records of meetings, um, you know, at the time, um, it's, it's difficult to, to make an assessment of that. But it's also, I, for me, and this is conjecture, um, but nevertheless, for me, it's difficult to think about this particular announcement in isolation from the announcements that have been made elsewhere in the region. And you can see the same kind of dynamics playing out obviously in, in Australia now as well with this raft of net zero announcements also increasing pressure on the federal government here to um, think about uh, making similar kinds of statements. Of course, the proof of the pudding is in the, uh, is in the eating. I don't know if that metaphor quite works, but, um, but you know, the question is kind of, what are you gonna do about it? How are you gonna get there? So first point to make, let's take a quick look at where Japan is at in terms of emissions reduction. Um, the first place to go for that is to look at its, um, it, the, the nationally determined contribution, essentially the international commitment that Japan has made um, under the uh, UNFCCC agreement. And you can see that um, it, it, it's ratified the agreement obviously, and it just recently resubmitted its NDC um, setting an emissions reduction target of 26% below 2013 levels by 2030. It's a little complex. I'll show you a graph in the next slide, which you know gives you a, a sense of what that actually looks like on a on a you know um, in a figure. Um, also, um, the uh, there's a second statement in Japan's um, NDC, which is. Uh, the, the goal um, uh, of, of all members to the, um, the uh, COP, 
um, of, uh, of achieving at least a 50% reduction of global greenhouse emissions by 2050. And as part of that, the goal of developing countries to reduce emissions in aggregate by 80% or more by 2050. So that statement's obviously a little less clear uh, in, in numeric terms, but what it does say is that Japan was like other advanced industrial states, somewhat committed to an 80% reduction um, by 2050. So net zero, um, you know, pushes Japan 20% uh, further than that, um, and also probably ups the level of kind of commitment uh, associated with it. So it is a, a pretty significant step forward relative to what we've, you know, we've seen so far. Where does Japan stand today? Um, well, uh, this shows you uh, CO2 uh, emissions equivalent. That is um, everything, you know, essentially CO2 is used as the uh, unit of analysis and other uh, emissions type are translated uh, into uh, CO2 for the purpose of measurement. And you can see that actually in terms of emissions reduction, Japan is doing pretty well at the moment. And this is despite that really rapid uh, increase that you saw, uh, particularly um, following uh, the Fukushima disaster, you can see um, that there's been an annual mean decline um, of about 32 or 33 million tons of CO2 from 2013 through to 2019, which is the period when the most recent figures are available. Um, and you can see that a mid-century net zero target would require a year-on-year -year continued reduction of around 39 million tonnes uh, every year out to 2050. You know, if that, that's if it's linear, uh, of course. Um, um, and, and so, you know, uh, Japan is doing quite well um, thus far in terms of emissions reduction, but it's worth pointing out that it gets harder the further you go. That is, um, you know, it, it, it's relatively easy to, to switch off uh, inefficient older coal plants like Japan is about to do, for example, um, to kick off, you know, a lot of investment in solar and so on initially when the good sites are available. Um, but, uh, you know, it gets harder and harder if you start to deal with some of those more difficult um, to decarbonize sectors. So although Japan is doing well, I think it's pretty clear that uh, there's going to need to be a step change in the types of uh, approaches uh, driven by policy, which um, are, um, you know, which the governments are implementing. So, um, so to summarize that, um, you know, Japan set a very ambitious target. The uh, target uh, is in line with many uh, other countries in the region and indeed globally. Um, in order to, uh, you know, Japan is in a pathway towards decarbonization. So it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And when you think about how quickly that might happen, it's clear that there needs to be an increase in ambition. And there also needs to be uh, an uh, increasingly a strategy for dealing with harder to decarbonize sectors like transport and like heavy industry. So, if I was to summarize, um, you know, in a couple of a couple of points, uh, all of that, that's that's where I guess I would I would put things. So, where uh, where it is, um, what what what's Japan looking to do about this? So there's there's a huge uh, amount of um, different uh, uh, areas of policy making going on right now, in a lot of different areas. Um, and like, uh, unlike Australia, but like many other countries, it's a, it's a big mix of different types of policies. You've got a lot of uh, investment in uh, research and development and also in the deployment of new technologies. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. Um, there's a whole discussion, which we can maybe get into if people have interest in it, around phasing out inefficient um, thermal coal plants. And there's also a discussion about um, co-burning things like ammonia uh, in the existing coal fleet in order to reduce the uh, emissions associated with them, the, the, the use of those um, plants uh, and increasing the amount of ammonia that's burnt over time. So where Japan's kind of at right now is doing an assessment of what the basic policy setting should be to achieve net zero um, uh, by, by 2050. 
and uh, I we expect uh, I expect um, the the conclusion of that to um, to to uh, come out sometime in the middle of in the middle of this year. As I mentioned, that's for the first time really being informed by a um, uh, an integrated assessment, really, where they're kind of modeling different uh, pathways to decarbonization and what the costs are associated with those. And that that process is being done right now um, as we speak. So there's quite a quite a lot of work going on on looking at what's what's the most exp the least expensive way of trying to trying to get there. And the basic trade-off which is being discussed is, is between um, uh, renewables, obviously, um, in the power sector, um, and here I'm talking specifically about the power sector, renewables, nuclear, um, uh, thermal uh, generation, that is gas and uh, coal, and the use of carbon capture um, usage and storage, as they're, as they're talking about it in Japan. And then finally, um, ammonia and hydrogen in particular. And I know that in Queensland, um, in particular, there's you know there's um, some uh, hydrogen projects under development, and that's a very interesting and an active area of policy development in Japan as well. We could maybe talk about that. Um, so that's kind of where Japan is up to now. On the on the innovation side, um, these are the key uh, sectors which uh, the government is looking at, at, at targeting. And it's looking at developing detailed uh, decarbonization scenarios across each of these sectors, these 14 uh, areas, kind of demand sectors, but also obviously automotive, um, nuclear, hydrogen, ammonia as a fuel. Um, you can see them all here for you, um, you know, to, to, so you can take a look at them yourselves. I don't need to read all of those out. Um, the, the, what I thought, you know, each of these areas, like there's a huge amount of work going on uh, in terms of policy development and uh, we can't cover all of them and I, I couldn't because I don't know all the detail across all of them either. What I thought I would focus on is one area um, which, which uh, is, you know, perhaps the area where Japan is being most ambitious in terms of decarbonization right now and that is in the offshore wind sector. So Australia is actually developing a regulatory framework for offshore wind development too, although it'll be less of a big deal here. But it is an area in which Japan has has um, is is putting um, a, a big bet. So the way that this is this is happening um, is uh, is that um, uh, a, a fairly new body, which is made up actually of uh, domestic and a couple of international companies. Uh, as well as uh, Japan's ministries and agencies uh, are developing a fairly comprehensive industry strategy and industry policy, those things we used to talk about with Japan in the 80s, um, to, uh, you know, to look at how to deploy offshore wind and um, how to make Japanese industry more competitive in offshore wind as well. And you can see here the deployment goals which have been developed. So um, about 45 uh, gigawatts of power uh, from offshore wind by 2040. Um, there's tiny amounts of offshore wind today. So, um, you know, this is rapid growth, um, about a gigawatt a year of, um, of new projects every year out to 2030. And the interesting thing about it is you can see that um, the main areas for this are um, in Hokkaido, in Tohoku, particularly northern Tohoku, that is in Akita and Aomori, and then down in the Kyushu region as well. And Kyushu is very interesting because they've got the highest amount of solar penetration already. Um, and so that means a little like South Australia, they're starting to get really saturated with renewables and you, you start to get questions about grid reliability and those kind of things. But you know, it's a very, very active area of policy making at the moment, um, you know, uh, which, um, you know, a lot of companies are investing there and looking at projects there now. It's quite an exciting area to work, I have to say. What that, um, that, uh, th that, that body has, has proposed to government and uh, is, uh, as I said, 10 years um, of, um, of additional uh, capacity in offshore leading to 10 gigawatts by 2030 and then up to 45 gigawatts by 2040. 
um, which is a, a significant increase from before. Um, there are a whole bunch of other things that have to be done in there, some regular detailed regulatory changes around how, how projects get developed. Um, it's cluster policies like you are seeing in Australia for hydrogen, for example, where you kind of identify areas and then think about what um, industrial capabilities you can add around those areas. Um, there's the beginning of a discussion around linking offshore wind generation with hydrogen, uh, which would be actually comp in competition with Australia's hydrogen exports when we um, get there. And also improving the competitiveness of Japanese companies within the supply chain across, uh, across offshore itself. And one of the um, interesting things, I'm just kind of giving you this detail because I, I, I think what it, you know, if you think about each of those 14 areas that we've, uh, that I brought up for you before, a similar level of detail is being discussed. That is, um, you know, some fairly technical, um, but also fairly ambitious discussions uh, uh, about overcoming the uh, challenges to um, decarbonization. So in the case of offshore wind, the big problem is that, or one of the big problems I should say, is that uh, you know all of the wind, or the attractive wind is in Hokkaido and in northern Tohoku or in Kyushu, but very much like Australia, Japan has a constrained grid. So um, you know the grid's been built by uh, the utilities, the former utilities when they monopolized particular areas within Japan and they were vertically integrated monopolies. And the grid structure really reflects that. And what that means is that it's difficult to generate power in Hokkaido and um, send it uh, to, um, to the population centers in Tokyo and so on and so forth. And in fact, the, the government's done some modeling uh, within um, uh, the, um, the regulator has done some modeling uh, of, of what congestion looks like in these graphs. Um, now, this is a kind of, you know, slightly technical graph. Um, it just shows you really um, the connections between different regions and it shows you um, how much those, uh, those uh, interconnections, that is the, the transmission lines between those areas are likely to be full up by 2029 unless further investment goes into them. And you can see that between Hokkaido and Tohoku um, up, up here, um, and you can see uh, that, um, you know, between Chubu and Tokyo, for example, between uh, Kansai and Chubu, between Kyushu and Shikoku, you know, the expectation is that the lines will be really full. So, you know, there's a big, big question in the offshore, in the offshore sector about um, what you're going to do about that. It takes a long time to build transmission lines and they're pretty expensive. So, um, just recently, what we've actually seen very recently um, is the proposal to put in place some large, um, high capacity, high voltage uh, direct current cables to enable that power to flow. It's exactly the same idea that you're seeing in Northern Territory with um, this proposed giant solar project, which will send power to, um, to Singapore. Uh, you know, that's obviously much more ambitious, but the idea is to have a dedicated line that would get around all those transmission constraints. Now, there's obviously a huge amount of discussion that needs to happen around that. Um, and uh, a lot of technical discussion, a lot of assessment of costs and so on and so forth. And you, you, you know, you see this kind of um, dis debate and you can expect this kind of debate really in every sector. So in steel, for example, um, some of you may have seen that Nippon Steel um, has announced that it's going to release a net zero 2050 target. And so there's gonna be a lot of debate coming about how to decarbonize steel in Japan, which obviously has big implications for Australia, given um, that Australia is a supplier um, of metallurgic coal to, uh, to Japan amongst other things. So I'll talk a little bit now about um, just a couple of minutes really um, about the implications for Australia and then I'll stop. Um, uh, but I just wanted to introduce this offshore mini case to you if you like, because I think it gives a reasonably good sense of the ambition. It gives a reasonably good sense of 
what policy looks like uh, ultimately um, if you're looking to push towards net zero uh, in you know one in one particular technology space so um, you know the details will be very different if you look at transport for example um, but you know you can expect as we're seeing now that the the fairly technical policy committees which METI and other ministries have and operate so well to uh, you know to really kick into gear to begin to um, think about um, you know how to be more ambitious across all of those different sectors that we talked about before. So, what does that mean for uh, for Australia? Well, I wrote um, something um, for the East Asia uh, Forum um, late last year, saying that. Um, you know, th this is a, a terrific uh, opportunity for Australia in some ways, but probably the first thing to mention um, is uh, Australia's commodity exports to Japan. Um, this is uh, the, um, the value um, that is in, in Australian millions of dollars, so billions of dollars ultimately, um, of exports, commodity exports uh, from Australia to Japan. And then the share of uh, exports to Japan of the total um, exports from Australia by value. And you can see that across these key uh, areas, uh, iron ore, met coal, thermal coal and, uh, and natural gas, that Japan is a very significant market to, uh, to Australia. So, um, you know, we can debate uh, about whether Japan is going to get to net zero by mid-century or not. Um, I'm pretty sceptical that they're going to be able to do that. But I think that even if you're sceptical, the statement and the kinds of policies that we'd be seeing being put in place right now do mean that, um, you know, that demand uh, for these, uh, many of these products, uh, certainly met coal, thermal coal and gas, are likely to have peaked or to peak this year, next year, and that the demand outlook for them uh, for in, in Japan um, will, will, will not improve over time beyond this. And that's just because we're starting to see, you know, the big ship that is Japan's energy consumption or energy demand begin the process of, of turning more rapidly um, away from an energy intensive economy. As I said, I think it's going to be very, very, very challenging for them to get there uh, by mid-century. But, you know, if you get, you know, um, down to 20 percent, uh, um, then, you know, that has big implications for obviously for our, our exports. The other point to make about it, um, and I, I was, um, uh, last year uh, uh, at the ANU, we submitted a, uh, a, a submission to Parliament, uh, one of the parliamentary committee, um, about uh, export opportunities from the energy transition. And we were uh, invited to come to Parliament. Um, and there was a discussion uh, around coal and the implications of, um, particularly for thermal coal. And one of the points that was made by one of the members uh, on, the, on that committee uh, was that there are many other countries which uh, are buying Australian coal. So even if uh, Japan um, thermal coal imports begin to fall, that there are substitutes within the region. That's definitely the case. But um, you've probably seen a number of announcements uh, uh, from countries um, in, in the region, Vietnam being an obvious example, um, and Bangladesh, Pakistan, uh, some reconsideration of a coal heavy power generation fleet. And the reason I bring this up is because of Japan's really important role in financing coal plants, in particularly in the Asia Pacific region. That's the Japan Bank for International Cooperation, NEXI, or the Nipp Nippon Export uh, Import Agency, uh, and to a lesser degree, um, JICA, or the Development Agency of Japan, that they've actually lent um, a lot of money um, in developing um, coal plants around the region. And another development because of this shift in Japan's position is that they're walking away from, um, you know, continuing to invest in coal in the region. So, um, you know, you've seen uh, much more stringent uh, policies being put in place around uh, lending in the region for coal. So I think there's definitely the case that, you know, there are other export markets that Australia might tap. 
also for gas, um, but um, but uh, it's also the case that a lot of that infrastructure has been financed by Japan uh, and China, and that Japan at least is um, beginning to think about um, or is uh, reducing that. Um, this is the last slide I want to raise just around the opportunity side. So, um, you know, to give you a sense of what I'm saying here, I'm saying, well, you know, there are some big risks here uh, around these billions of dollars of, uh, in value terms of exports to Japan, which I think the government of Japan is now signaling uh, are not going to grow and will begin to fall over time. Um, that uh, the Japanese government's decision is also going to have regional effects because of its important role in infrastructure finance. And then um, the last point I wanted to make is um, about the opportunity. So, um, you know, uh, obviously in terms of scale, uh, the, the, these kind of new markets, that is for example, green ammonia, um, you know, are tiny compared to the, just the size of the projects, the infrastructure and the value of exports that we have currently to Japan. But, you know, energy transition is a, is a decades long process, uh, just like building, um, you know, the LNG industry, for example, was a decades long process beginning really in the 80s. Um, and you're starting to see those kinds of new industries emerge now. Japan is putting a big bet on ammonia, for example. Um, as it says here, uh, a 20% co-burn of ammonia in Japan's um, coal-fired power plants by 2030. And um, they're looking to ramp that up afterwards. Now, engineering colleagues tell me there's going to need to be quite a bit of innovation in this space because ammonia's property um, in terms of uh, its, uh, its um, uh, the heat value of the flame essentially is quite poor. And so um, there needs to be innovation in order to be able to burn greater amounts within Japan's coal plants, but that's the direction that they're going in. And, you know, Australia is identified along with other countries as a supplier. In fact, you know, one company called CWP has got a project that they haven't reached final investment decision on yet, but they're looking at a huge uh, um, combined solar and wind project in Western Australia to uh, manufacture green ammonia and, um, and then to export that to Japan. And there are other projects as well, which are being discussed along that base, along those kind of lines. I know that in Queensland, you have a hydrogen project, for example, um, which is also um, at the demonstration phase. So there is um, a lot of opportunity, I think. Um, it's gonna take time. Um, and and, and my, the point I wanted to make in that East Asia Forum article um, is that you know now's the time to really kind of map out what that future picture might look like. Um, that is, what are the opportunities for uh, Australia to um, you know to connect with Japan in some of these new areas? We have a lot of dialogues around um, coal, around gas, um, around iron ore, um, but not so much in these other areas. And so I do think that there's an opportunity to to expand uh, discussion in order to um, think about what opportunities are there. And, uh, you know, uh, um, Australia in this case has really a lot to share with Japan as well. To give you one example, um, Japan, uh, you know, is, is trying to build competitive electricity markets at the same time as pushing renewables into its electricity system. That's something in Australia we can do quite well. And uh, I think that, you know, there's a lot to learn from Australia and South states like South Australia. Uh, around that issue and Japan, you know, is a close partner um, and, you know, that doing that would be very much in line with our strategic interests as well as our economic interests. And so I do think, and it's something that I'm exploring uh, right now, um, that, uh, that um, having some kind of um, track 1.5 uh, structure to enable discussion across multiple sectors to see what the opportunities are is something that the Australian government and that the Japanese government should consider together. Um, let me stop there and stop sharing. I think I'm around uh, 35 minutes or so. And, um, and then welcome your comments and questions. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks very much, Llewellyn, for a great, um, a, a great uh, contribution. Very, very interesting and, uh, and thought-provoking. Uh, I'll ask participants if they can start putting 
their questions up on the uh, uh, up on the board for me to ask. But at uh, AIIA Central here, we've got a few questions for you that we might uh, that we might lead off on. Um, the I, I suppose the obvious one is that the impact of the uh, Fukushima disaster on Japan was profound. Um, uh, according to the material I've read in 2011, they had 54 nuclear plants accounting for about 23% of uh, generation. Now they have nine equated to about 6%. Uh, they uh, clearly will need to, uh, for the time being at least, to significantly increase their uh, uh, nuclear generation uh, uh, for base load uh, purposes, or one would presume they would. Would you care to comment on that? Uh, and also, in a in a very volcanic country, you've not mentioned geothermal. So, uh, can you perhaps, you know, the non wind, non solar uh, aspects of what they're going to do back to nuclear, back other other, other technologies? Sure, and let me um, just put one quick slide up um, again, just to show you the nuclear picture. Um, uh, so here's the nuclear picture here. This may be a little old, actually. Um, maybe there's one or two units which have restarted, um, which are not up here. But um, but this gives you a picture of um, of where nuclear stands today. Um, so the green uh, units here are ones which have restarted at least once. I know some have kind of come online and gone offline again, and different things. But they've kind of got through the safety uh, inspections. Um, the orange ones are units which are where the utility is applied to restart, but um, there's been no conclusion yet. Um, you know, so that essentially goes to the new safety regulator, um, which exists. And then the red uh, are, um, are, are decommissioned um, plants. And um, a couple of points to make here, well, three points to make on nuclear. So the first point is, there's um, an entirely new uh, post Fukushima, a new decision making structure around um, nuclear restarts, which means that um, it is less under the control of the utilities as the asset owner or the central government than it used to be. That is, there's obviously the new um, nuclear regulatory agency, which unfortunately, um, you know, dissolves into the acronym of NRA, which we all know from a different context. But um, but uh, in any case, um, the, the the regulator, um, you know, has got more stringent safety standards around the existing um, nuclear fleet, which have to be met, and they've demonstrated themselves to be fairly independent in carrying those assessments. The second thing is that um, repeatedly the LDP um, post Fukushima uh, and the DPJ obviously were different, um, but, but but that's that you know that's old news now. Um, have said that you know there's no restart without local um, local approval, and there's been quite a lot of division or difference between governors in particular, many of whom are shown for you here, um, around their position towards nuclear restarts. So um, in the boxes here. The outside of the boxes are green in some cases and red in some cases. And that kind of shows you the, um, the position that the governor uh, at, the, at that time, this data may be a little old, but has taken towards nuclear. So, um, you know, firstly, there's a new regulatory process. Secondly, under that process, and at least the norms around the importance of local agreement before new uh, restarts, there are significant barriers to um, you know, getting nuclear up, uh, you know, to a big share of um, of the of generated power, um, again, um, and then the 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 third um, point uh, that that I wanted to make on on the nuclear story is, you know, it's it's a recent development, but I think a really important one. If you look, I mentioned um, earlier about the. Um, the uh, the modeling exercise which is being done to identify the 2030 targets um, for for different generation types and um, the if you look at the different scenarios there are six different types of scenarios which the government's asked to be considered and the biggest share of generated electricity 
in those targets is 20%, in, in those scenarios is 20%. Okay, so they haven't, they're not asking to model a 40% nuclear scenario um, or, well, 40 might be ambitious, but let's say a 30% um, target for 2030. So that would mean, uh, you know, many more of these existing plants getting turned on again. So, um, you know, I, I think that uh, nuclear remains a really difficult subject um, because of the local issues um, and obviously the, the, the awful experience uh, of, uh, of, you know, the Fukushima nuclear disaster, um, you know, following the tsunami. Um, it, you know, it remains a difficult issue. The government has, I think, um, taken quite a piecemeal approach to seeing how far those restarts are going to get. Um, but now we're starting to get some clarity around that. And, um, you know, you're, you're looking at, um, you know, kind of 20% of generated supply at a maximum for nuclear moving forward. The other point, of course, is that under Japanese law, um, the, uh, you know, nuclear plants can run for 40 years um, or if the regulator approves an additional 20, so 60 at an absolute maximum. And, um, you know, we've got quite a few uh, first generation, second generation nuclear plants, and I haven't got it here, but if you look at the, you know, at those, then you're going to start to see nuclear capacity tapering off because they, um, the units will reach the end of their operating life um, and, and will need to be taken offline. So unless you start replacing them, then you know, nuclear is gonna play a smaller and smaller share out to, towards mid-century in Japan's energy mix. That's not something that the government's been willing to take on so far in terms of re, um, um, a new build or replacement. Uh, um, on, on just very quickly on geothermal, so geothermal is interesting. Um, geothermal is pretty small. So, um, you know, it's difficult to get the kind of economies of scale out of it that you can get out of others. I know that America, actually the Department of Energy in the US is actually quite ambitious and bullish on, new, on, on geothermal. But um, to give you an idea of where the government sits on it, um, they have formally defined um, geothermal along with biomass as power types which are unlikely to be um, uh, able to compete on a non-subsidized basis within the electricity market. So there are different reasons why, but, but there, um, you know, we can't expect it will be any more than 1% of generated power. Uh, thanks for that one. And uh, uh, keep those questions coming in, please. Uh, Llewellyn, uh, we know from contemporary discussions in Australia, uh, that uh, uh, for reasons, political reasons, governments in New Zealand, for example, and also the suggestion is in Australia that agriculture be carved out of uh, any uh, uh, net zero emission requirement. Uh, we know from certainly looking at the greenhouse cost abatement curve that uh, for uh, tons of CO2 emitted uh, per value, uh, in fact, agriculture is, is, at, a, is at an extreme end. Uh, the agricultural lobby, to my understanding in, in Japan, and maybe I'm wrong here, whilst not as significant economically, is very politically powerful. Yeah. Uh, what's the story in Japan? Are they also excluded or are they agitated to not to, to be excluded? Uh, what's that situation there? Yeah, it's a great question. So the, uh, the first point to make is that, is that um, emissions from uh, agriculture are really um, in, you know, just insignificant in terms of Japan's overall emissions profile. So it hasn't been a, a huge part of it in terms of a sector that needs to be dealt with. Um, you know, I'm look, I, I won't share the screen again, but I'm looking now at the moment at the, um, at the um, emissions by by um, by sector, and um, you know it's pretty it's pretty small. Um, the uh, the the other point to make about it is, um, I guess, about the agricultural sector is um, the agriculture sector has been playing a role in in um, around the design of Japan's decarbonisation policies, but it's primarily in the area of biomass and. What I mean by that um, is that, you know, that there are fairly significant subsidies which go towards biomass um, in Japan. 
and um, you know, essentially, you know, it's a feed and tariff. So at the moment, at least, so that um, you know, you get, get guaranteed rate of return, or you guaranteed to sell your electricity at a certain price as you generate it. And um, you know, Japan's feed and tariff rates have been very attractive for a long time. The um, um, and you know, in biomass, there are quite a number of part-time farmers in Japan, and uh, some of the types of biomass which uh, are available uh, you know have the potential to be a kind of second income source um, for uh, you know in for um, you know part-time farmers and some of these small farms like you often see in the regions within Japan so in a way there's kind of a subsidy which exists towards the agricultural sector because of the feed and tariff around biomass would be one way to think about it the other thing, and I've looked into this less, but it's definitely the case. And for those of you pre-COVID who, you know, hopped on a Shinkansen and travelled around Japan, um, you will have seen um, that, uh, you know, that, that um, solar PV, some of the larger solar PV facilities, um, have been built on um, on agricultural land or on abandoned agricultural land sometimes. And there's kind of a, as I said, I, I'm not completely across the details of this, but there, there, um, there has been a you know, quite a lot of discussion um, around, you know, kind of redesignating agricultural land so that it is available to be used for solar PV within ag uh, regional areas, for example. So rather than you're kind of worrying about the methane problem, or let's say, you know, like in Australia, we're talking about um, sequestering carbon in soil, right, as one way of, you know, uh, decarbonizing. Um, in Japan, it's been more um, about, um, you know, the kind of opportunities in the renewables or the low carbon energy space where the agriculture sector has really intersected um, with, uh, with the decarbonization agenda. Thanks for that. Uh, another question, um, you focused a lot on the issue really of supply of method of generation yeah uh, can i take you to demand um the uh, again in area of my experience australian greenhouse abatement cost curve the hard stuff was always in generation um, it was a bit easier and in fact even someone who didn't believe in climate change uh, would be irrational not to invest in energy efficient building and transport because yeah. you have a positive payback there now japan is very famous for world-class innovative transport certainly but has the government got any initiatives in doing even more in transport and doing even more in the built in the built environment sector where you certainly can uh, have a, a net economic positive as well as a planet positive outcome yeah definitely so um you know i mean in terms of japan's energy efficiency performance in general i mean one thing to say you know australia does terribly america does terribly canada does terribly we all do terribly for a reason um it's not only policy it's also because we're big um and so you know if you measure the amount of kind of energy input through a unit of economic output um that you know big countries tend to do worse um uh, just because of distances to travel um, and so, you know, it's not only about kind of great policy, which has led Japan to be fairly efficient. Um, but having said that, um, you know, Japan does a huge amount in that. And actually the current 2030 demand assess, right? So how much electricity demand do you have in 2030? Um, you know, uh, that estimation bakes in uh, quite a lot of additional energy efficiency. Um, so in order to be able to match supply and demand and cut emissions at the same time, it's not only about, you know, pen getting more penetration with renewables, etc., but it's also actually about, um, about uh, reducing um, uh, demand. And, um, and, and I forget the percent, maybe 13% reduction relative to 2013 by 2030 or something like that, which is quite a lot on top of what Japan's already done. So... The way that um, you know Japan does this through, is through a particular. It's quite an ingen ingenious. Um, I don't know if it would work in Australia, but there's a, a law called the Energy Efficiency Act, which basically sets um, uh, high-performing technologies or regulations uh, as what they call the top runner, and um, and then um, the uh, other um, market participants or companies which manufacture in the area could be building materials, transport, actually the electricity sector too are kind of required to try and meet that standard um, over time. 
There's no financial penalty for not doing so. It's very much name and shame. But, you know, because of the importance of industry associations in Japan, um, uh, you know, maybe some other factors around the way that the economy works there, um, that you, you know, that, 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 that particular regulation has had, you know, pretty positive effect. So that's the main regulatory tool which is being used. So if you look at the coal phase out stuff that we've seen, um, you know, being discussed, that's driven through that particular law. Um, the, uh, in, in the transport sector, if you talk about passenger vehicles, for example, um, you know, I expect a lot more to happen here. So um, Japan's done a lot in electric vehicles, but Toyota, which is by far the largest of Japan's automakers, right? Like it makes 10 million cars a year and, you know, Nissan makes one. Um, you know, uh, has been um, slower uh, than um, uh, many others um, and has continued to push kind of Prius type technologies rather than going to battery electric vehicles. They've been skeptical about battery electric vehicles, but that does mean that transport remains a difficult problem to solve for Japan. So I think there's going to have to be a lot of changes um, that happen here. I would just note that um, although Toyota has been quite slow in this area, um, at, at least are skeptical about embracing um, elect pure electric vehicles, they, they have been investing a lot in battery technology. So it may be that they're waiting, particularly around solid state batteries, which will give more range. Um, and it may be that they've been waiting around for that technology to, to be commercializable before they jump on the bandwagon. But, um, you know, there's no way around um, some difficult additional steps um, in the transport sector if you're going to get to uh, net zero. Well, thanks very much, uh, Llewellyn. We've run out of time. We've got more questions, but uh, we always like to finish at, at seven. So thank you very much for, I've got to say, I'm so impressed. Obviously, of course, not just... Uh, for what you've spoken about, but the breadth of your knowledge um, in terms of related and uh, knock-on issues. So I found it tremendously entertaining, as have my colleagues here at AIIA Central in Brisbane, uh, and I'm sure those online have, uh, have as well. So thank you very much for your wonderful contribution. We'll make sure that that's available on YouTube for people uh, for later reference. Uh, just a quick commercial for what we've got coming up. Our next talk is uh, in a month's time uh, on the 2nd of March, Justice Judy Ryan, Family Court of Australia Appeal Judge, uh, going to be delivering a very completely different topic and a very interesting one, the Family Court of Australia and religious courts uh, in Indonesia. Uh, so she has done a lot of work with Indonesian religious courts and how they've managed to work together and with different systems. Uh, but have common values and shared understanding. So that'll be a really interesting one. Don't say at the AIIA, we don't have a, a, a lot of uh, different movement variety in what we do. So again, uh, please uh, join me in virtually thanking Llewellyn for a great talk tonight uh, on a very, very interesting and important issue that's just as important for Australia. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for tuning in and we'll see you all soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.